about half of what is now in our oceans. This water was contained in interconnected chambers, forming a thin spherical shell, about half a mile thick, perhaps 10 miles below the Earth's surface. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water stretched the crust just as a balloon stretches when the, the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack, following the path of least resistance, encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the Earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 10 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. All along this globe encircling rupture, fountains of water jetted supersonically almost 20 miles into the atmosphere. The spray from this enormous fountain produced torrential rains such as the earth has never experienced before or after. The Bible states that all the fountains of the great deep burst open on one day. And it describes these events about 5,000 years ago, which we can now tie together scientifically. Some of the water jetting high above the cold stratosphere grows into supercooled ice crystals and produce some massive ice dumps, burying, suffocating, and instantly freezing many animals, including the frozen mammoths of Siberia and Alaska. The high pressure fountains eroded the rock on both sides of the crack, producing huge volumes of sediments that settle out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. This erosion widened the rupture. Eventually, the width was so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like the seam of a baseball. The continental plates, the hydroplates, still with lubricating water beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of about 45 miles per hour, they ran into resistances, compressed and buckled. The portions of the hydroplate that buckled down formed ocean trenches. Those that buckled upward formed mountains. This is why the major mountain chains are parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. The hydroplates in sliding away from the oceanic ridges opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. On the continents, each bowl-shaped depression or basin was naturally left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. The demonstrations you have just witnessed of a massive worldwide catastrophe in antiquity supports the biblical story of the deluge in every detail. Uh, again, at the time, in 1993, he was saying that it jettisoned, the, the pressure was there to jettison 20 miles up into the uh, atmosphere, but since then, uh, as we discussed, supercritical water temperature would have had the energy to actually send things uh, deep into space and make the comets and the asteroids as we've discussed. So if the supercritical waters of the great deep erupted with enough force to send rock, water, and debris into space, because this is a picture from Dr. Brown's book, uh, and there is the energy to send the debris into space. And so if that happened, then could this be why if you look at that moon picture, you can see when we look at the moon, the, there's one face always pointed towards us. The, the other face we never see. On this, they've taken pictures, they've sent a spacecraft up, and if you look to the right of the center of the moon picture is the back side of the moon that we never see. To the left is the part of the moon that we always see. When we look up at the moon, you see that face of the moon, those dark areas. What we now know those are, are huge lava flows on the face of the moon. And has given it really a smoother appearance than the backside of the moon, which is cratered. So if you look at this, you can see that the, the near side of the moon, what we look at, is somewhat has these blotchy areas, which are not found on the other side. Huge lava flows not found on the other side. Uh, seismic equipment that our astronauts have left on the moon that have been reactivated show all the earthquakes happen on the near side of the moon. And so the theory is, you know, the theory has it that the Earth spit at the moon. 
Uh, spit at the moon huge rocks and chunks and debris that when, by the time it's coming crashing in at thousands of miles an hour into the lunar surface, it would have created huge magma flows. And so when you look up at, at, as Christians, I do believe, based on this theory that I've been researching for years, all the evidence is supporting it, that when we look up and we see the face of the moon, we're watching the lava flows that occurred from the Earth. Now, yeah, the evolutionary scientists have a very difficult time explaining why the front side of the moon has been so impacted because if it was some kind of asteroid or meteor shower that went through, any meteors heading for the moon, what are they going to hit on the near side of the moon? Uh, they're going to hit Earth. Earth is a natural shield to the near side of the moon unless the Earth spit at the moon, unless the Earth is the source of what was happening uh, to create that difference uh, that we see in this slide. Now, Here's another, now we're going to shift to another understanding, and this is one of the most important understandings for all your children that go to an evolutionary geology class. It is a fact that all over the Earth there are layered strata, and one continent has the same layered strata as another continent in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases the same. So, so the evolutionists will say over millions of years, you know, some volcano lays down a strata, some this lays down a strata, and these strata are found all over the earth, and there's also layering of fossils all over the earth. So that's why they came up with this evolutionary millions and millions of years of slow uh, laying down of sediments and animals to create the fossil record. Well, there's an alternative to that idea. So I'm emphasizing the sediment layer here. It's not to scale because the crust was uh, 10 or more miles thick. There's still a, a thin layer of subterranean water underneath the crust, and the entire Earth is flooded. Now, the water is still leaking out from underneath the crust, and if you could look underneath the water, the crust would have been fluttering. There would have been, an up and, there would have been a continuous earthquake going on on every single plate of the, of the Earth, every single crustal plate on the Earth would have been having an earthquake. As the crust was fluttering, the fossils would have been laid down, density layers would have been laid down, there would have been this sedimentary layer distributed globally as it was shaking and the, and the sediments were compiled, uh, were piled up into these different density layers because of a phenomena called liquefaction. Dr. Brown has a chapter on liquefaction and what he explains is this is a concrete tank that had been sitting in the ground in Japan when they had a, an earthquake. And it was an earthquake when there was a lot of water in the ground. And the, and the shaking of the ground took this low density tank and moved it up and popped it right out of the ground. Shifting to another idea, how do we know this is true? In the 1950s, when we were doing extensive oceanography, mapping the ocean floor as a country, actually the whole world was getting into the idea that when he saw this ocean ridge, those arrows, are pointing to a continuous ocean floor mountain. You can't see it because it's underneath the 